our scripture lesson for today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 5 through 21. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation of heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Peter addresses the crowd. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his hands, I'm sorry, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, once you see clearly, once things come into vision, it's hard to ever go back to not seeing clearly again. I was in the sixth grade when I got my first pair of glasses. It's an exciting time to have glasses for the first time, you know, going straight into middle school. It's what every middle school student hopes for, is to be diagnosed with a vision impairment and need glasses right as they're making that transition into the teenage years. It was a, it was a thrilling time to have to get glasses. I, um, I don't know why I was so, so insecure about them. Lots of kids had glasses and nobody really bothered me or made fun of me because of them, but as soon as I had them, I kind of wanted out of them, right, as soon as possible. So immediately, I began begging my parents for contact lenses. Um, it was kind of still a day and age where that wasn't super common and it was a big, big ask for me as like a 12, 13 year old kid to have contact lenses. They were smart as parents, smarter than I thought they were as a teenager. <laughs> because when I asked them, they said, you know, uh, not now, uh, wait a year, ask us again in a year. Um, show us that you're responsible, right? Like that you're not gonna break your glasses and lose them all the time. And if you can be responsible with your glasses for a while, then we'll talk contact lenses. I remember when that year came and they finally let me have them, not only because I was excited to see clearly in a way that I'll explain in a minute, but also because somehow I also talked them into letting me get color contact lenses, which was way in back then, and I had like neon green eyes for a while, it was kind of crazy. You know, I put those contact lenses in my eyes and everything changed. You know, not being able to see well, glasses helped a lot. And you're like, you suddenly see the world differently. But going from glasses to contact lenses, well, that changed everything. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when you wear glasses, you can see clearly where there is glass. But where there's not glass, it's still blurry, right? 
And it always bugged me that my peripheral vision was blurry all the time. So you have to like move your head in order to see what you need to see clearly. And it just bugged the dickens out of me. So you put contact lenses in your eyes, and that goes away. It's almost like you forget that you couldn't see in the first place. And as soon as those contact lenses went in my eyes, I never took them out again. I was the world's worst optometry patient on the planet. Because they give you all these instructions about healthy eye care. And it involves things like taking your contacts out at night. Um, or every couple of weeks throwing them away and putting in a new set. Or cleaning them every couple of weeks with special enzymes and going back once a year for your proper appointment. And I don't think I did any of those things as a teenager and young adult. Because once I could see, I couldn't stand not seeing, right? So you get invited to a pool party, and the last thing you want to do is take out your contacts as a teenager and what, like, blindly feel around the pool for the next four hours. That's no fun. So I risked it. I'd wear my contact lenses all the time. I slept in them every night. I wore them all day. I wore them to pool parties and every event possible. Because once I could see clearly, I didn't want to ever see blurry again. It's like the lights went on. My vision changed. And I couldn't live any other way. So much so that once I became a responsible adult and could scrape together the money, I had my eyes lasered. So I never had to worry about it ever again. By the way, one of the best moves I ever, ever made. <laughs> so if you're thinking about it, maybe you should too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, maybe you should, but that's between you and your eye doctor. So. <laughs> Today, I want to share with you a passage of scripture that we heard from Acts chapter 2 that tells us about new vision and how the disciples and those gathered in that upper room saw very differently all of a sudden with the sound of the mighty rushing wind. We heard the passage just a moment ago, but I want to spend a little bit of time refreshing our memory about what happened up to this point, like which part of the story we're hearing together. Remember that um, the disciples had walked with Jesus for a couple of years. Together they had learned who he was, not just as teacher and rabbi, but eventually as Lord and Messiah. They followed him with their life, all the way to Jesus' death, when they would realize the fullness of who Jesus was for them. Jesus, of course, was arrested, punished, put to death. And ultimately rose again to new life, giving us hope for life now and promise for a life still to come. And the disciples got to witness every moment of that. Following Jesus' resurrection, he spent a number of days meeting with the disciples, um, showing them that he really was alive. They hadn't just imagined his resurrection. It was indeed an actual historical fact because they could reach out and touch his body. He spent time teaching them again, fellowshipping with them, connecting with them, even eating breakfast with them as they fished on the Sea of Galilee. Um, right before Jesus prepared to go back to his rightful place at the right hand of God, Jesus meets with the disciples and gives them two final instructions. One of them we know is the Great Commission um, from the book of Matthew, the end of the book of Matthew, where Jesus gives them a job to do. He essentially says, I'm leaving, I'm not going to be with you anymore, and so since I'm gone, you have a job to do, and that's to take the message of what I've done to all of Jerusalem right here and to the edges of their world, right? To Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You've got a job to do. I'm leaving, and it's up to you. Jesus then gives them one more instruction. And this instruction is small, but significant. And without it, I don't think that the disciples would have had the encounter that they had with the Holy Spirit that day. Jesus simply says to them, stay here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. A very simple instruction, but two final commands from Jesus. Stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then when you do, Go into all of the world to tell others about what you've experienced in me. As they wait in that place, eventually, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God had promised comes. 
And the scripture describes it as the sound of a mighty wind that rushes into the room and tongues of fire that appear over the, the disciples and those that are gathered there. And then this experience that we heard in today's text where they began speaking in other languages but understanding what each other was saying. Something that could only happen with this supernatural power. They experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in those tangible ways. And once they do, they are forever changed by their personal experience with the Holy Spirit. So much so that no one has to convince them to live into the other command, the mission to tell others about Jesus. They become so changed, so filled, that they are emboldened with power, and they literally give their lives in the fulfillment of the mission that Christ has called them to, to take the good news of his death, resurrection, and saving power to the ends of the earth. Today, I think we can learn a couple of things from this encounter between the Holy Spirit and the disciples that can help give us new vision, help wake us up to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and in the world around us now. And so I quickly want to make a couple of observations about the text and then talk a little bit about what it might be like to have new vision and Holy Spirit power. The first observation I make is simply this. The disciples were obedient to Jesus' instruction. And I don't think that they could have landed in the right place and the right time to have this experience with the Holy Spirit if they weren't first obedient. See, Jesus gave them that instruction, wait here in Jerusalem until I come. But that instruction was a little bit loaded. Jesus had literally just been arrested, punished, put to death, rose from the dead. And it wasn't a very safe thing to be a professing, believing Christian at that moment in time. They literally feared for their lives, for their own well-being. Remember that Peter, just days before, had denied that he even knew Jesus because he was so fearful of the consequences it would bring to himself. So when Jesus says, stay there in Jerusalem, it's kind of like, uh, yes, yeah, stick it out in this place where you might be persecuted, punished, and even put to death until I give you your next move. It was a risky ask of Jesus, but the disciples were willing to follow and be obedient to the instruction. See, I don't think we can experience the Holy Spirit filling, awakening, full use of his power if we won't also be people who are fully obedient to the instructions from Jesus. But we often try to do one without the other. Like we say we want the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we say we want all that Jesus has to promise, but then God asks us to do things, gives us particular instruction, and we resist the instruction, question it, and sometimes are even outright disobedient. Now, I imagine that because the disciples are human, that when Jesus gave them the instruction, they probably um, had their own um, questions about the instruction. I can sort of hear them going like, uh, ooh, are you sure that's the best move, Jesus? I mean, you know, we might be punished and arrested and went, go through what you went through. Maybe we should hide somewhere else. But at some point in time, even if they questioned it, even if they struggled with Jesus' instruction, at some point, they chose to obey it. And they simply did what Jesus asked them to do. If you want to be a person who's alive with the fullness of the promise of the Holy Spirit's power in your life, then it probably has to begin with your obedience to Jesus' instruction and command in your life. You likely can't have one without the other. And so if you have to begin anywhere, with a new hunger, a new desire for Holy Spirit vision and power, then maybe start with the simple steps of obedience. Jesus, what are you asking of me? What do you want me to do today? How am I to respond to this circumstance in my life? And the more you align yourself with Christ in Christ-like obedience, the more you align yourself up to be in the right place at the right time for the Holy Spirit to move in your life, or in the lives of the people around you. But I don't think you can do one and get the other. I don't think you can expect to see the Holy Spirit at work in your life or in the lives of other people and be disobedient. I don't think those two can live together. And that's as challenging of a word for me as it might be for you today, because I think all the time we're pushing back 
on Jesus, thinking we know a better way, or certainly there's another angle, or maybe we don't have to do everything that he asks us to do. But there's something about being obedient to God that lines us up with where the Holy Spirit is at work. The second observation and step that we can take, I think, is this. The disciples followed that instruction to stay in Jerusalem, but they did something while they waited. The scriptures say before this passage that they spent time in the upper room in prayer as they waited for the Lord. They didn't just wait. They waited in anticipation. They waited desiring to see God to move. And they listened for the voice and instruction of God in the waiting. And they could only do that in prayer because Jesus wasn't with them anymore. Jesus wasn't there in body, so they couldn't lean on his physical instruction. Instead, they had to be people who sought out the voice of God in their own personal prayer life. If we're going to line ourselves up to be in the right place at the right time when the Holy Spirit moves, it will probably require that we be people of prayer in the process. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, it fixes our vision on God instead of on the other things, right? So instead of worrying about the circumstance they were in, instead of being anxious about the trouble that they might experience, they set their focus, their vision on God himself. And then they listened for the voice of the Father in that prayer and waiting. The more they spent time in prayer, the more they were attuned to the voice of the Father. And so then when God began to move and act among them, they recognized him for who he was, because they knew his voice. See, I think the Holy Spirit is working in and around us all the time, but sometimes we don't recognize it because we don't recognize the voice of God. We don't recognize his presence when he's working because we've not spent enough time knowing him in relationship. That's what prayer is all about. I know it can be an intimidating subject. I know sometimes it can be overwhelming. I know sometimes I don't have the attention span to pray well. But listen, prayer is literally just entering into conversation with God. You tell him what you're thinking and feeling. And then the most important part is that you spend time listening in return to what God might have to say to you. And I know that that sounds like easier said than done, since God doesn't typically speak audibly to us when we pray, but you will begin to hear the voice of God and get more familiar with the voice the more time you spend in stillness listening for him in prayer. And so you begin to go, God, is that you giving me peace? Um, God, is that you telling me to call that person today? And the more you sort of question that and test that and go, I think that's you, God. I really want to be obedient to what you're asking of me. Is that you? And then the more you live in that, the more you test the voice of the Father, the voice of the Spirit in you, the more in step you get with him because you get more and more familiar with those nudges and promptings, right, as he pushes you in times of prayer. So make sure as you make prayer a priority in your life that you're not just uh, pinging prayers off to God like a honey-do list or some sort of magical wish list. Make sure that you're spending time receiving what God has to give back to you. And usually that's the things of peace and joy and comfort and stillness as you sit in his presence. Now, I will say that I'm not the type that can spend hours on end in prayer. My attention span doesn't allow it. So my prayer life tends to look more like a small chunk of time throughout the day, um, where I'm in continual conversation with God, and then spending some periods of time saying, what do you want from me? What are you trying to tell me? What do you have for me? If you have questions about how to take the next step in your prayer life, or you feel like it's missing something, I am quite confident that Pastor Larry and Pastor Kathy will help you find a resource or a connection or a conversation that will help you do that. All right, observation number three. So they were obedient. They focused a lot of attention on prayer. And the third is that they did it together. In Christian community, they did not pursue um, the awakening of the Holy Spirit alone. Now, I am born and raised here in Illinois. 
I tell my East Coast husband that I am a good Midwestern girl. <laughs> there are things we do and don't do here in the Midwest that are unfamiliar to him as an East Coast kid. One of them that I think we have gotten too comfortable with here in the Midwest is thinking that our faith is private, that it's personal, it's between us and God, and it's nobody else's business. As a pastor, I've had people tell me as much, right? Like, um, worship is between me and God. Uh, what God is doing in my life, that's me and him, and I don't need to talk to anybody about it. The disciples waited together. They prayed together. They were anxious for the Lord to do something, and they focused on that together. And I believe that Holy Spirit awakening comes when we pursue God together. Not privately, not individually, but in corporate pursuit of the best that God has for us. Now, I am not saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you privately. He does to me. I'm not saying that you can't have a special relationship with God in private. I think you absolutely can and should. But I think the kind of movement that we see in Acts chapter 2 of the church being awakened to the Holy Spirit comes because they together hungered for God to move among them. And they pursued it together until they had it. If we want to be people of Holy Spirit awakening, then we have to be churches and communities of people who are pursuing that new vision and awakening through the power of the Holy Spirit. That means that you should get out of your comfort zone to take more, pursue more of your faith in community and connection with people who are doing the same, right? So you should study the Word of God with other people who are hungry for a movement of the Holy Spirit. You should pray with other people who are hungry for a movement of the Holy Spirit. You should worship together as people who are hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. And together, the Lord will move among you. Every experience I've had with a movement of the Holy Spirit has happened in corporate worship together, not alone and in isolation. And I recognize that that pushes us a little beyond where we're comfortable, but I don't know anything about the Holy Spirit that is comfortable, right? It tends to always push us beyond what is normal to us. And that makes sense, right? Because if the Holy Spirit were normal, if it were um, this, then we wouldn't need to hunger for anything or pursue anything. would have it already, right? But the Holy Spirit is extra, beyond ordinary, beyond normal, supernatural. And that requires um, a faithful pursuit on the part of God's people. So those are some of the things that I think we can do together. We can be obedient, we can pursue prayer, and we can be desperate for a movement of the Holy Spirit together in community. Those are the things we can do. But I want to speak for a minute about what Peter recognized was happening among them and what this whole thing really means for us. Right in the middle of this text, we hear Peter get up with the 11 disciples and explain what was happening among them. As he does, Peter throws back to an Old Testament passage from the book of Joel. It's um, a, a prophet, the guy is a prophet, and um, he was given the job thousands of years before to point people back to God through repentance and a returning to God. A prophet was a guy who was chosen, or a girl, chosen who was to give good news to God's people, to turn them back to God, but often they were unpopular because they were telling people to stop doing things, right? Like, quit it, cut it out, you're being disobedient, you're not honoring God, you need to return to him. And that was Joel's job. So Joel, thousands of years before, declared a promise from God. He said, God will one day pour out his spirit. And when he does, he's going to give it to everybody. Sons and daughters, servants and children, men and women, young and old. One day, God is going to give himself to all people. And as this very strange set of things was happening, Peter recognized it for what it was and said, this 
is that promise that God made thousands of years before. It's happening right now, and you get to be part of it. The incredible thing about this message that Peter was pointing to from Joel is it wasn't just a promise that they experienced one time there together in the upper room. It was a promise that was being unfolded for that one time and forevermore. And so the promise that Peter is reminding them of in the book of Joel is a promise for us now. And I want you to try to capture the significance of this moment in time. It is the mark of the beginning of the church. It is a moment in time that fills the disciples with new vision and power, and they accomplish more of God's work in the world than they had ever before. But what this passage really means is that the fullness of the Holy Spirit and His power is as available to us now as it was to them, right? He is saying things like there's no restriction on the work or the capacity of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman, if you're young or old, the Holy Spirit can live in you in ways that it did then. With power, with purpose. He says that young men will have experiences with the Holy Spirit that will call them to something more. They'll have vision. Old men will dream dreams about what is still possible. I want you to recognize that that means there's no age limit on the Holy Spirit's fullness of power in you. Don't count yourself out because you think you're too old or too young. The Holy Spirit, he's saying, is ready and available to fill you with an encounter, regardless of where you are in life. And this declaration that Peter is making about men and women is also significant. Because in that day and age, women weren't, weren't much more than property, and they certainly didn't have much of a place in the church. And Peter is making a bold declaration, saying that even women will have the ability to interact and respond with the work of God in the same way that these male disciples had. He's telling us that the possibility of experiencing the fullness and the power of God is available to us, and God wants to do as much in us as he did in them. And I don't know if you've ever spent any time considering it. Have you ever thought that the Holy Spirit wants to move and stir in you in the same way he did for those disciples that day? That he wants to give you vision? He wants to give you dreams rich with his Holy Spirit's um, generosity? He says you'll prophesy. That means that you'll declare the promises of the goodness of God to people. Did you know that God wants to use you in that way? And the Holy Spirit that made it happen in those people that day is working in you and around you now. I think there's one more thing, though, that may get in the way. I want you to notice that when the Holy Spirit began to move, that there were some who were resistant to it when it happened. They blew it off and said, oh, they're just drunk. And Peter had to explain his way out of that. It's no coincidence to me that the people who were gathered in that room were all religious people. The people who were waiting there were expecting God to do something. We're not talking about some secular people watching the religious people have an experience and blowing it off. We're talking about a room full of religious people who were waiting there because they believed that God was going to do something. And yet, when God began to do something, some of them um, resisted the move of the Holy Spirit and gave credit to something else. And I have to stop to acknowledge, as a longtime Methodist and church person myself, that many times we say we're eager for God to do something, for Him to show up, for God to move. But then he does, and we resist. Now, I say that as a Methodist pastor who had um, a father who was a United Methodist clergy person right here in this conference. My husband is a pastor. My aunt is a pastor. My husband's mom and dad are pastors. I know religious people well. And I know that I've had my own points in time where I've been resistant to the work of God. Sometimes, religious people, church people, are the most notorious for it. Sort of beginning to line ourselves up with what God wants. But then when he begins to move, stepping back, 
and holding him at arm's length. And I don't know about you, but once I began to see their resistance in the text, it made me sick to my stomach. Like, how often do I say I want God to move in my life? I want him to awaken me. I want him to use me. But then he begins to push or move, and I go, oh, that's surely that's not him. And I push him back, and I resist him. The people who were able to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit that day saw God for who he was when he showed up. And I hope today that what we stir up together is a desire to see God when he moves for what it is, and people who are hungry to receive it, to participate in it. Now, I know as a good United Methodist, all of this sounds crazy cakes. I get it, right? Visions and dreams and prophecies and miracles and healing. But God is doing those things in and around us. We either choose to see it and participate in it or to deny it and resist it. And I don't know about you, but once I began to see the Holy Spirit at work in my life in new ways, I wanted to see more of it, not less of it. Right? Once I caught vision of the Holy Spirit in and around me, I wanted to see it again. It's like once you see clearly, you don't want to unsee ever again. I remember having my first experience with vision of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to tell it to you now, um, even though I know we're running on a little bit. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell it to you because I think half of the problem is we don't talk about it. We don't talk about our experiences with the Holy Spirit, and they become sort of taboo or extraterrestrial, right? I was a senior in high school, and I was attending a church camp that I had attended most of my life. And I, the night before, had, or no, that night, had been called into ministry, accepted a call to ministry. I um, was excited to tell my youth pastor about what had happened, so I ran back to our cabin to tell him because he hadn't been in worship that night for other reasons. I ran up to him and I said, Mark, you are never going to believe what happened to me tonight. And with the most deadpan expression on his face, and not even looking at me, he said, oh, you were called to ministry. And I got really mad. And I said, who told you? Like, that's the meanest thing in the world for somebody else to tell you this news. And he kind of looked up at me, straight-faced, and said, oh, nobody told me. He said, last night you were praying at the altar in the tabernacle. And I was sitting in the back, and I saw the Holy Spirit anoint you for ministry. Which, for the first time, somebody was telling me about a vision they had had of the Holy Spirit. But it also confirmed what I was trying to sort out for myself. So do you see what I'm saying about pursuing the Holy Spirit together? I don't know that I'd be here if he hadn't confirmed what he saw in me that day. I needed that word from him of prophecy and hope. So I returned to the tabernacle, kind of processing what he was telling me and what I was experiencing. But I didn't go inside. I waited on this flower bed that was outside of the tabernacle. It was a brick flower bed. I sat on the edge of the flower bed, and I looked up, and I saw with my eyes um, what I call a shroud over the tabernacle, like a see-through blanket. But it was warm and glowing and was very clear to me that it was the presence of the Holy Spirit covering and entering into that place of worship. Now, I don't know at the time that I would have called it a vision. See, I think sometimes we're scared of it because we think it's some sort of out-of-body experience. But most of the time, vision is like your own eyesight, but with the Holy Spirit giving a little extra that you wouldn't have seen on your own. When God, through the Holy Spirit, gives you words of prophecy or vision or dreams or healing work, he will always do that gently. He never sort of forces you. He never, like, takes over your body. It's more like you living in God and him showing up to accent very gently um, what he's doing in and around you. Today, I want to invite you to see with new eyes with new vision. Are you hungry for the work of the Holy Spirit in you? Or do you sometimes resist what he's doing because it seems out of the ordinary or uncomfortable or scary in some way? 
Today, as we close in prayer, I will simply invite you to begin participating in what the Holy Spirit has already poured out, what he's already doing in and around you, but simply to enter into it in new ways, because you want to be a person in line with what the Holy Spirit is doing. You want to see what God is doing in the world around you. So as I pray, I just invite you to receive, right? To look, to open your eyes, and to tell him you want to catch a vision that only he can give. Let's pray.